Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater is proud to present Photoplay Magazine's Gold Medal Award screenplay, Valley of Decision, starring Greer Garson and Gregory Peck. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we present a play you've all been waiting for. A play that was chosen not by us, but by you of the motion picture audience. It is Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer screen epic, The Valley of Decision. Selected as America's favorite motion picture of 1945 in a nationwide poll made by Dr. George Gallup's Audience Research Incorporated. After tonight's performance, Valley of Decision, its stars, director, and producer will receive Photoplay Magazine's coveted gold medal award. Our stars tonight who play their original screen roles are Greer Garson, who for the second time in two years has been voted America's favorite actress, and Gregory Peck, whose meteoric rise to stardom has been scarcely duplicated in the screen history. In this week of popularity polls, I'd like to remind you of one constant poll that goes on day after day, year after year, with always the same satisfactory results. It is your daily preference for the product that presents tonight's play, Lux Toilet Soap. Here in Hollywood, among America's most glamorous screen stars, the vote is 9 out of 10 in favor of Lux Toilet Soap. And I'm sure that lovely women everywhere, from Maine to California, appreciate this dependable aid to beauty. I might even say aid to romance. Our curtain rises on America's favorite screenplay, Valley of Decision. Starring Greer Garson as Mary Rafferty and Gregory Peck as Paul Scott. In 1873, there was no finer house in all Pittsburgh than the house of my father, William Scott. It stood on a hill like the throne of a monarch. And below where the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers joined... There was our great steel mill. Beyond the mill were the flats. Here were the shacks, the homes of hundreds of workers, and Irish, all of us. Here I lived with my widowed sister and my father, Patrick Rafferty. I'd been looking for work, and one morning, word came that I'd found it. Work? What kind of work, Mary? House service, Pop Darling. It's all set. Providing a lady likes me personality. Personality? What's that? The looks of me. Mary, what lady? Will you start getting mad right now, Pop? Why? Because the house where I'm going, it's the house of William Scott. Now, now, Pop, take it easy. The man that took his legs from me? The man that made me a cripple for life? Ah, Pop, dear, it was an accident. And Mr. Scott's paid you full wages ever since. Yours was an accident. And him tossing a bit of charity and forgetting all about it? By the holy saints, he won't forget about it when we get our union. But meanwhile, I have to work, darling. Won't you say good luck to your Mary? I would if you was going up there to poison them. Open the door. Let me wheel this out of here. Yes, Pop. A little sunshine will do you good. Sunshine, is it? You mean the dirt and the soot of the mill? But no black of the dirt and the soot of the scot to put it there. Oh, it's getting worse, Kate. Worse all the time. Nothing to do but nurse his hatred for the scot. Someday it'll drive him mad. Mary... I saw Jim Brennan. I told him maybe I had a job. He said he'd board here if I'd rent your empty room. Now, isn't that just like him to be wanting to help us again? He's such in love with you, Mary. I should be loving him, too. But I do not. Well, off with you before you're late. Good night, Kate, dear. Good luck, Mary. Better go by way of the king for you this fall. Mary Rafferty entered our house the same afternoon I returned from England. And my brother Willie came back from Boston with his fiancée and her parents. We were having a dinner party that night. Delia, our housekeeper, found plenty of work for the new maid. Are you doing fine, Mary? Fine. Oh, well, now I've got to go and help the cook. Oh, but do you hear the dinner table? It isn't set. 
Yes, Lush Girl. That's nothing but a service bell. But it's for me, is it not? It's only Mr. Ted and his constant. Yeah, it's still ringing. And I say, don't worry about it. Just put them in their place right now and they'll stay there. Oh, holy oh, listen, Bridget, guide me. I'll be back later. Now be careful of the china. I will. Forks. Three forks for everybody. The fish fork, the fork for the roast, or the little fella for the salad. And three spoons. The service plate stay on for the soup. And two wine glasses. I'm for what? you. Did you know, Miss Constance? Spoons and eyes on Now, Mary right. Walsh could get off to a bad start with me. Oh, here you are. Uh, Mary is the name, isn't it? Mary is right, Mr. Ted. Fish fork and salad fork. My mother here. says uh, you might be the Irish answer to good Presbyterian prayers. Well, that's nice, sir. Uh, confidentially, Mary, we really run this place. Uh, Connie and I. The spoon's on the right with the knife. Do you know? And what are you two doing in my pantry? Oh, oh, hello, Delia. We're meeting a new maid. Straighten your tie and get into the drawing room. What will the Gaylords think? They'll think their daughter has very delightful in-laws to be. <laughs> if you ask me, Julia, too nice to brother Willie. Oh, now. If you ask me, we'll be having two sisters-in-law pretty soon. Yes, you should have seen Louise came when she saw Paul. She kissed him. Your brother's just back from England. I kissed him, too. Now, inside with you, inside. Well, I Go along, Connie. I don't think we're wanted here. Heaven forgive me, that lie. What lie, Delia? About Louise Kane and Mr. Paul. Oh, he doesn't care that for her. But Mr. Ted was right. She'll hook him one of these days. Oh, but she's lovely looking. I'm real sweet, Delia. Sweet? Huh? <laughs> oh, she turns it on and off like a faucet. But she'll get him with her living next door and scheming and conniving. Uh, oh, even now, girl, the finger bowls. Finger bowls? Mm, there, on the second shelf. Finger bowls? Hmm, they dip their fingers in them and wipe their mouths. Oh, just very elegant, Mary. I never expected to see the likes of it in all my life. It will be like a baptism. Well, go set the table. Dinner will be ready in half an hour. Oh, I'll never get it done in time, Nep. Oh, dear. It's done. It's praise the saints it's done. I've set the table. You have? Oh, sir. No, I, I didn't see you. You're new around here. Just today, sir. What's your name? Mary Rafferty, sir. Well, Mary, I thought it says you may announce dinner now. Who, me? Of course. Oh, he thinks I couldn't do it, sir. All those grand people in there. Well, all you do is catch Mother's eye and say, dinner is served, ma'am. Dinner is served. Oh, now it's served. Couldn't you do it yourself? Could you not just whisper it to your mother? Oh, no, my brother Willie would never forgive me. What a breach of the proprieties. Breach of the what, sir? Never mind. I'm going inside now. You follow me. Yes, sir. That's right, sir. Mm -hmm. Julia, you haven't built us the most important place. Oh, certainly. Dinner is served, ma'am. Why wouldn't you and Willie get married? Oh, not till June, Louise. Daddy, you should get married in Boston. Do come, Louise. Please, ma'am. Oh, how nice. Dinner is served. Uh, excuse me, ladies, but Mother, I think dinner is ready. What? Oh, Mary. Dinner is now, ma'am. Thank you, Mary. Well, shall we go in? Yes. I did it. I did it. I did it. Oh, Bridget, thank you. Insist on talking business. It's time for us to go inside. Mary, the gentleman will have cigars. Yes, ma'am. Now then, Mr. Gillard, you were about to say something. Uh, yes, Mr. Scott, I was. About Andrew Carnegie. Cigar, sir? Yes. You're wondering, Mr. Gillard, why I don't throw our meals in with Carnegie. Well, frankly, we can't understand why you won't come in with us. Well, there are a number of reasons. You're looking at three of them now. Paul, Willie, and Ted, my sons. I own my own puddle, Mr. Gaylord, and that's where I'm going to stay. But if it's security you want... Well, it's not just a question of security. We... Oh, uh, I, I beg your pardon, Father. That's all right, Paul. Speak up. Well, uh, I... Well, you see, Mr. Gaylord, my father's father started the Scott Mill with nothing more than his bare hands. It's become a giant of a thing, sir, but it's got a heart and a soul. Steel is as much a part of us as... Well, it's, it's the blood in our veins. And so are the men who work for us. When we accomplish something, we know it because of the feeling we get in our hearts. And if we sold out, it would be like, well, like something dying. Here yeah, you see, sir, my sons are my partners. It's their mill, too. And with God's help, it'll be here for their sons. Well, gentlemen, I dare say I have my answer for Mr. Carnegie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mary. Yes, sir? We'll have a brandy in the drawing room. Yes, 
Oh, by the way, Dad, you'll be at the mill in the morning. If I don't die in my sleep, why? Oh, just a new idea. I'd like to talk over with you and Willie. Well, if it can wait till the morning, could we join the lady? I forget Julia's inside, Willie. Come on. And that's the whole idea, Father, an open-heart furnace. But it'll take a fortune in experiments. Why do we want to bother Willie! To... An open-heart furnace, Paul, you really think well of it? If we can perfect it, we can make any kind of steel we want. Soft, hard, pliable, rigid. That's why they have more varieties of steel in Germany than we have here. Germany, eh? Father, isn't it about time you sat back and started to enjoy yourself? You mean loaf? Well, yes. Paul, any time you're ready, the money's at your disposal. I'm ready now, Dad. I've spoken with Jim Brennan. Brennan. He's no better man in the mill than Brennan, but he's all for organizing a union here. I'm pretty sure the open heart will take his mind off the union. Uh, go ahead. Let me know when there's something to see. Time, Jim. Past two o'clock. Uh, I haven't a wit left in my head, Paul. Let's go at it again tomorrow. On Sunday? Sure. I've something to show you. A model I've been fluttering with. Where do you live? At Pat Rafferty's. Pat Rafferty's? Haven't you forgotten my name is Scott? That's my point. That'll be after the late mass. And the bells will warn us when church is out. I'll be there at ten o'clock. How does it look, Paul? You like it? Looks good, Jim. Looks fine. It's just a model, remember? The real thing will take months to build. Oh, we could show it to my father and see if... What's that? It's them. They've come home. I never a church bell, did I hear? You'll come to church with us again next Sunday, Mary. You're a party, darling. We're through, Anne. Jim, we're home. Anne, wait a second. Oh, I didn't know you had company, Jim. Oh, good morning, Mr. Paul. Hello, Mary. Mr. Paul? Scott, the gentleman is Mr. Paul Scott. Scott? There's just one Francis Scott welcome, and that's six foot down. Well, that's pretty definite, Mr. Rafferty. But why? Because Pop's a blather and jackass. Blather, says you. Why am I in a wheelchair? Burn me legs because one day, after working well, bows, and I'm dizzy with the heat and sweat of the mill, I lost them. The scuttle will be everlasting, cracking the whip over slaves 12 hours a day. Look, you don't know what you're saying. Are you out of your mind, Rafferty? It's all right, Jim. I shouldn't have come here. I'm sorry, Mary. Oh, how could you, Father? How could you? Go on. Go back to bending your knee to the man that crippled your father. I'm not ashamed of my job. Thank the Lord it's in the house of decent people where there's no hate and curtain. The door is open. Yes. Goodbye. Goodbye, Jim. Kate, I'll see you next Sunday. Will you walk home with me, Mary? No, oh, Mr. Paul, I can't think of what to say. It's a madman he's become. I'm so distressed. I don't know what... Oh, here now, here. All the neighbors are looking at us. You don't want people to think I've been beating you, do you? Come on, Mary. It's a fine day for walking. Mary, Mary, still full of tears. I, I, I'm sorry. And you haven't spoken a word. Here from the top of this hill, Mary, you can see all Pittsburgh. Why don't you sit down? Cry it all out. Hmm? I feel better now. Really, I do, sir. Oh, look, sir, there below us. The river and the mill. You know, to me, those bricks and furnaces, they're, well, they're human. The giant of a thing, with the heart and a soul, as much a part of you as the blood in your veins. Well, where'd you hear that? My first night at the house, sir. Eavesdropping, eh? Overhearing, they call it. You're a pretty girl, Mary. Oh, now it's getting late, sir. I have to be getting home. Well, we'll both be getting home. Together? Unless you're ashamed to be seen with me. Oh, no, sir. Oh, indeed not. Of course not. Good, sir. then. Come on. See, we're home in plenty of time. Holy saints, here we are at the front gate if anyone saw me. Well, hello. Oh, hello, Louise. I I'll get round the back way now, Mr. Paul, and thank you. Thank you. What did he do for you, Mary? Oh, oh sure, he'd just laugh and say it was nothing at all at all. Well, Paul, looking with the help on Sunday? <laughs> yes, and getting absolutely nowhere. Well, come in, Louise. As the months went by, 
Mary Rafferty, with the kindness, her understanding, with the thousand and one things she did unbidden for all of us, became more and more one of our family. She was devoted to my mother. And to my sister Constance, she was like a wise and protective older sister. It was quite natural, then, that Mary should accompany us when we all went up to Boston for Willie's marriage. On the boat coming home, quite late at night it was, Mary found Connie, her head poked out of her stateroom window, talking to a strange gentleman on deck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Oh. hello, Mary. Well, I, I'd better run along now, Miss Scott. Well, if I don't see you in the morning, you can always find me in Pittsburgh. Good night. I have got. Get away from that window, Miss Constance, and open your door. Yes, Mary. Look at you. I don't believe it. Talking to a strange gentleman is bad enough. But in your nightie... Oh, he's not a strange gentleman. That was the Earl of Moulton, and he was at Willie's wedding. In your nightie. Oh, now, Mary, it was all perfectly respectable. <laughs> he was out there, and I was in here, and, and besides, he's an Earl, and I think he's perfectly beautiful, and I always did want to live in the palace, and, and we'll know all the wicked people in your... Into place. bed with you. Oh, that's exactly where I was going. <laughs> Give him a prayer, she says. Just bounces into bed without even asking a blessing. Don't say enough prayers on Sunday. What shall I pray for? A titled husband? You might pray to the Savior to have mercy on your soul. Can a Presbyterian say, have mercy on my soul? He hears Presbyterians, too. Good night, Miss Constance. Mary, I told Lord Moulton you were my dearest friend. I meant it, too. Thank you, Connie. Hello, Mary. Oh, Mr. Paul, he's starting to wait, me. Mary, I've told you so many times I don't like Mr. Paul. Oh, then should I tell Delia and Cook and the rest? They mustn't be calling you, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Mary, what were you thinking about? I was just thinking that all my life I've lived by a river, but this is the first time I've ever seen water so beautiful, Mr. Paul. Oh. I, I don't know what to say. Well, you could call me, uh, hey, or look here, well now, anything, but don't call me Mr. Paul. Well, hey, look here, and well now, I'll be bidding all three of you, good night. Not yet. Hey, look here, well now, it, it's getting late. Mary, come here. I'm not going to apologize, Mary. I'm not sorry. I'm glad I kissed you. Well, then, can we just forget all about it, Mr. Paul? I don't know, Miss Rafferty. Can we? Good night, Mr. Paul. In just a moment, we'll bring you the second act of The Valley of Decision, starring Greer Garson and Gregory Peck. And now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. What's this week's item, Libby? Oh, I've been traveling, Mr. Keeley, on the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. Oh, to the Southwest. <laughs> oh, you're right. I've just seen a preview of the new Metro Gold Mayor musical, The Harvey Girls. Starring one of Hollywood's top favorites, and mine, Judy Garland. What part does she play? Well, Judy's a waitress in one of those famous restaurants of the 1890s. Mmm, she's so pert and pretty in that starchy uniform she wears. Think what an experience it would be to have Judy Garland serve you a meal. Oh, I'll bet you wouldn't know whether you were eating a sandwich or a salad, Mr. Kennedy. Or care, Libby. All I'd see would be those big dark eyes and that lovely... Lovely Lux complexion. That's it, Libby. As you know, Judy Garland, the leading lovely in the Harvey Girls, is also one of our leading Lux girls. Lux toilet soap never had a more enthusiastic fan. Judy finds the active leather facials are just right for her skin. And her complexion is really something. Smooth and soft enough for camera close-ups. No wonder nine out of ten famous stars depend on daily Lux soap care. Such a simple care, too. As easy as this. Here's all you do. Cover your face generously with the creamy active lather. Work it well in. Rinse with warm water. Splash on cold. Then pat gently to dry with a soft towel. These Lux Soap facials give skin fresh new beauty. In recent tests of this care by skin specialists, actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. 
Try Lux Toilet Soap for your own precious complexion. See how effective this gentle beauty care can be. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Act, act two of The Valley of Decision, America's favorite photo play for 1945, starring Greer Garson as Mary and Gregory Peck as Paul. <laughs> saw very little of Paul Scott in the year that followed. The open heart was built, and week in and week out, Paul struggled with his experiment, determined to justify his faith in a new person. Hello, Mary. Oh, Mr. Paul. I didn't expect you to be coming home through the kitchen. No, I wouldn't have come home at all. My father doesn't think I'm getting enough sleep. He sent McCready for me. Oh, that's where McCready went. What are you doing up this time of night? I'm just fixing your bite of food. So, Dad thought I should get a good night's sleep, eh? I'll, uh, I'll take this tray up to the study for you. Well, can't I eat here? If you wish, sir. I do wish. Mary, I'm licked. The furnace is a failure. Well, now, I suppose your father knows what he's talking about, doesn't he? Why? Well, didn't I hear him tonight saying he was coming along to beat the band? Oh, you should have seen the pride in it. Oh, the waste of money, the waste of time. It just won't work. Do you mind the story of the Irishman named Bruce? Irishman named Bruce? Yes, indeed. Him hiding in a cave. Licked entirely and all despairing, watching a spider trying to make its web. Well, the spider kept swinging and missing and swinging and missing. Couldn't make ends meet at all at all. He never stopped trying. And finally he made it, Mr. Bruce. He gave a big hurroo. He burst out of his cave and he raised it entirely. <laughs> In Scotland, I think Bruce was in Scotland, Mary. Now, who cares what they think in Scotland? But how could your furnace be a failure and you the best steel man in all Pittsburgh? My father said that? No, Jim Brennan. When? Down at the flats last Sunday. But you were here last Sunday. You were here all day. Oh. Oh, now. Well, well it must have been some other You time. sent McCurdy for me tonight, didn't you? I was that worried. Your father said he was afraid you were becoming discouraged altogether. And that's all he said. Yes. Well, I won't quit, Mary. I promise. I know that. Mary, if I do, Mary, if the hearth works, unless I can come home and talk to you about it, it won't mean very much. Paul, Let me finish. No, don't. Don't you must. There isn't anything in this world as big as the way I feel about you, Mary. I see you flitting through this house taking care of us, and you're always at a distance. You belong close, Mary. Right here, in my arms. Please, please let me go. You love me, Mary. You know you do. And if I love the ground you walked on, there's nothing can come up. Marry me, darling. Please, marry me. Paul, I'm a servant in this house. This family is good to me. They don't want to see me make them a laughing stock and and people to call me a a scheming conniver. Stop it, Mary. It's true. It's true. All I know is that I love you. Mary, don't go. Please. Please. Is that you, Mary? Yes, ma'am, it's me. Mary, did you happen to hear Mr. Paul mention when he'd be coming home tonight? He is home, ma'am. He's in the kitchen. The kitchen? After supper, ma'am, he was hungry. Don't go, Mary. Ma'am? Tears, Mary? Bad fairies at the well, ma'am. I have to be leaving you, Mrs. Scott. Leaving? Truly, I don't want to. But it, it's my father, ma'am. And my sister. He, he has to get out in his wheelchair. My father, I mean. And, and my sister has enough worry with the tears of the baby and all. And, and so I thought that... My poor brain isn't working very well. Mary, my dear. Going back to the flat won't solve anything. I asked you where Paul was because something happened tonight and I wanted to tell him. But I think I shall tell you first. Nothing's wrong, ma'am. Oh, no, nothing's wrong. Only it was so sudden. Connie and the Earl of Moulton ran off tonight and were married. Married? So young. But they seemed very much in love. And Mr. Scott, ma'am? It was quite a blow, but he finally shook Giles' hand. They're leaving tomorrow for England. England? Yes, Mary, and... Connie asked if I would let you go with her. Go to England? Yes. She wants you so badly. 
And you, ma'am, would you like me to go? There's nothing I want you to do. Only what do you think is better. Well, ma'am, if I can be of more help over there than here, and I... Well, I always did hope that one day I'd stop him. Surely that is the only difference. A chance to go. Maybe a blessing. The morning will be time enough for your answer. I know now, ma'am. I... I just have to get to Just look at this piece of steel. Where did this come to you about it, Jim? Ah, you don't just make railways with steel like this. Buildings and bridges that can swing with the breeze. It's a miracle. Wait, what? Mary, she didn't see it come in. About an hour. Last night I sent Paul home. But he comes back later, full of brandy he was. I'm talking about an Irishman named Bruce. We run the heat up and here's what we call it. The finest piece of steel in the world. Irishman. Mary, what are you doing here? Pop, Pop, I'm on my way to England. I just dropped in to take you to the Why are you going so sudden? Because it's a mess you got yourself into. That's for a long time. Make you sick. If you couldn't sick when she comes back here, help your stop then. You'll find the machinery rich and them with it. There'll be nothing of the kind. Not while I'm the head of the union. Come on, Mary. Oh, Jim. My father's possessed by the devil. Oh, this is only the start to drive him crazy. Mary, surely you know how it feels for you. It might be better if, if you stayed here and married me. Pop, all wrong. But that's a fine thing, I said. I'm going to England with Miss Constantine. Is that better than being with me? Oh, it's not better, Jim. It's Paul's part. He wants to be married. Mary, how did you know? So, Mrs. Scott and I... We're, we're putting the ocean between us. How about your own feelings? You wouldn't like it, Jim, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, man. And God bless you, Jim. And so I left Paul Scott and was gone. And the distance widened with every drill and month. Many letters he wrote. Enough to break my heart. So full were they of his love. But I could not answer, for I'd come to England to go out of his life. And then in time, Paul's letters became fewer and fewer, until there were none at all. But now and again, he wrote Connie with news of the family, and the mill, and... All right. Come to the tree, and I'll tell you everything he wrote. You're not homesick, are you? Well, aren't you? Not in the least. Oh, no. No, you have to have a heart in your bosom. Yes. Paul said half the mills in Pittsburgh have been closed by stuff. And Ted's been bad again at college. Yes, poor Ted. Oh, and, uh, this. Louise Kane is with us a great deal now. She's kind and sweet and a great comfort to mother. Well, I think I must that's what happens when you have a heart in your bosom. Oh, Mary, why didn't you marry him? Do you think it would have been a proper marriage for your brother? Why not? Can you see me at the big table, dining, with Julia and William there, and me trying to make conversation with your Pittsburgh friends, and Paul just sitting and, and watching to see if anyone's even looking at Ruby? But you wouldn't have to live in Pittsburgh. Oh, if you or Ted or Willie had been chipped off the old block. I'd have married Paul and gone with him wherever he wanted. What? Yes. But you're selfish and fucked. Every one of them. Paul's the only hope your father has. The whole world. And Paul's a great deal man. Oh, Connie. Connie, why can't you mind your own business? Oh, no. I wish we were like we wanted to be. Well, maybe we don't be yet. People do change. Look at Louise Kane. Louise Kane? Kind and sweet. Paul says she is. You'll marry her one day. Well. Send for me, Mother. Sit down, Paul. Your father's worried about you. Yes, Paul, I am. It's not natural the way you shackled yourself to the mill. <laughs> but I like my work. I like my work, too. But I still found time to talk to Mother. Hey. 
What's this all about? Louise came. She's a fine girl, Paul. Oh. Didn't know to tell you. I, I said nothing, Paul. Tell me what? I'm in love with someone else, Dad. Man never to know what goes on in his own home. Who is this girl? Mary Rafferty. Mary Rafferty? She could have married Paul if she'd wanted. He would have left Pittsburgh in the mill and broken your heart. Well, why didn't he marry? Because she wouldn't have him. Wouldn't have him, eh? Wouldn't have him. What are you thinking of, Father? Eh? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Miss Mary Rafferty, Sierra Vale of Moulton, Oakvale Manor, Sussex, England. Please return to Pittsburgh at once and do this old man the honor of marrying his son. Signed, William Scott. Mary. Mary, is that you? Oh, Mrs. Scott. Oh, my dear, how well you look. Oh, how sweet. Oh, Mary Paul will be here any moment. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Scott told me driving home from the station. It's a strike at the mill. That's why he didn't meet you. He's been at Jim Brennan trying to arrange terms to settle it. Oh, welcome home, Mary. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here again. But Mary, where is it? What, ma'am? Your brogue. You've lost it. Oh. <laughs> sure, it is coming along with me luggage, ma'am. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited I haven't any brains at all at all. Not after what Mr. Scott's been saying to me. But inside of me, I'm... I'm still scared. It must be a sin to be so. Mary, darling, you're witch hunting. Am I? Say it again. Tell me I'm witch hunting. Tell me the devil hasn't got me up on a high mountain and, and showing me all the cities of the world in their glory. Mary! Hey, where is she? Mary! Look up the stairs. Mary! Paul! Mary, darling. Mary. Let me have a good look at you. Oh, darling, when I got the cable on the boat coming over, I, I... I... I just couldn't think. You knew I'd be waiting here for you. You knew it. Two years. Two long years. What a waste of time. Oh, Holy St. Bridget, what a waste of time. Paul! Yes? I'm sorry, but I'm going to talk to you right away. We'll be right down. Willie's here, Paul, with bad news. The strike? About the strike? Come into the library. I'll wait here in the hall. I'll be just a moment, darling. Well, Willie? I've planted the men down the flat. Informers? Detectives. I've just learned Brandon and his men are planning violence. I don't believe it. No, I didn't think you would. Dad, I thought I was to handle this strike. Yes, and the mills are still closed. Now, I've got hundreds of men lined up in Duffield. Good, tough fighting men. But you can't bring in strike breakers. They'll break the skulls of men we've worked with all our lives. Whose skulls you worried about? William Scott's or Patrick Rafferty's? Stop this. Stop it. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. A fine welcome home for you. My father... He's making trouble. Oh, it's just that your father hasn't changed, Mary. Please, now, don't worry. I lost my temper, Paul. I'm sorry. But the fact still remains you've gotten nowhere with the strikers. Now, Mary, if people, if Paul weren't concerned about them, he'd be less than decent. Dad, Jim Brennan's my friend. I know whatever he does, he'll fight clean. But we've got to get together and talk. Then they know where to find me. Look, Dad, they won't come down to the mill. They're off the payroll, and they figure they've got no place there. Listen, now do you believe me? That mob's coming here. Now, come over to the window and see for yourself. There are your loyal workers for you. I'll do no business with the mob. Yes, they're not here to sell any business. Listen. Oh, get back. Stand back, Father. The throne rock. Don't have me run away from them. Let me open that window. I'll talk. Father, look out. Paul. Paul's dying. It's all right. It's all right. It's nothing. You're bleeding. Willie, send the creature to the doctor and tell you. Darling, it's nothing. I'm all right. Willie. Yes, sir. Go to Duffield and bring those men back with you. If you hurry, you can catch the two o'clock. Yes, Father. Dad, don't do it. It wasn't Jim Brennan. It wasn't the Union. Those men out there, they're just a bunch of hoodlums. Go on, Willie. Get your cup. Oh, no. Wait. Can't we do something? I'm sorry, Mary. But if these strikers want war, we'll give it to them. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
In a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of The Valley of Decision, starring Greer Garson and Gregory Peck. Here in Hollywood, the world's capital of feminine loveliness, we're apt to take beauty for granted. It's hard to be complacent, though, when you find yourself in the presence of really classic beauty. I wish you could all see Miss Helen O'Hara, the young metro golden mayor actress who appears before my dazzled eyes tonight. Miss O'Hara, how does it feel to be the answer to a cameraman's dream? <laughs> really, Mr. Keeley, I don't know what to say except thank you. Have you always wanted to be in pictures? Well, you might say I grew up with the idea. My father is an artist, and I've acted as his model since I was 14. And my mother was in musical comedy and a Ziegfeld Follies girl. And what movies have you appeared in? As Thousands Cheer, and now I have a part in Metro Goldwyn Mayer's new production, Ziegfeld Follies. And your mother was a Follies girl? Yes. It's thrilling to play the same kind of part in pictures that my mother played on the stage. You'll make a lovely Ziegfeld girl, Miss O'Hara, especially with that very beautiful complexion of yours. May I say, it's a perfect example of what we mean by a luxe complexion. Why, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. You're right about my being a luxe girl. I decided long ago that if luxe toilet soap is such a favorite with famous stars, it ought to be a daily beauty care you can depend on. And it is. And that's the reason that nine out of ten Hollywood stars and hundreds of starlets use luxe toilet soap. They know they can depend on this fine beauty soap to give their precious complexions gentle, cherishing care. Here's something every woman can do who thinks her skin could be smoother, softer, lovelier. Get some of Hollywood's own beauty soap, Lux Toilet Soap, tomorrow. Use it regularly for a while. Then see if you're not delighted with the fresh new beauty it gives your skin. Mr. William Keeley returns to the microphone. After the play, when our stars will take their curtain calls, we welcome to the stage one of Hollywood's outstanding personalities, Mr. Louis B. Mayer executive in charge of production for metro goldwyn Mayer Studios. Meanwhile, we raise our curtain on Act Three of The Valley of Decision, starring Greer Garson as Mary and Gregory Peck as Paul. Early that night, with Willie on his way to Duffield, I left the spot house and went to the flat hoping against hope that Jim Brennan would listen to me. As the head of the union, he could stop any further violence. Oh, but Mary, must we talk about the strike? You just back from across the sea and how fine you look. Jim, Jim, where's Pop? Out making speeches against the Scots. There's trouble, Jim. Willie Scott has gone to Duffield for strike breakers. Strike breakers? But it's not too late. You can still stop them if only you meet with Mr. Scott. Paul sent you to tell me that. He did not, but I promise you Paul will be there with his father, backing you up. Oh, please, Jim. Go to the mills, salute Scott's armed guards. I'll never do that. Never. Fools and girls who won't listen to Jim, me. let's pop now. Pop! Pop, darling! Mary. Mary Angel. Oh, it's so good to see you again. Mary. I'd missed you so, darling. Oh, never to let a man know to just come out of thin air. What Santa Breeze brought you here, Mary? Darling, darling, I've a bit of news for you. Now, please, Pop, don't get mad now. About the Scots? Yes, and just for once, try to understand. I've come home, Pop, to marry Paul Scott. Yes, I understand. Even after all this time, you still turn against your own. You love who your father hates. With a hate that's got the blessing of God on it. I'm reaching into high heaven to put a curse on this marriage. Pop, no! Bear me with this, Jim Brennan. If my daughter ever brings any scotch into this world, may they get you dead. Mary. Mary, darling, don't look like that. If we're going to meet with Scott, there's no time to lose. Do you hear me, Mary? Come along with me. I'll talk to my men now. But you shouldn't have come to the mill, Paul. The doctor told you to stay in bed. Oh, I'm all right. And Mary let you leave? Mary wasn't home, Ted. She's been gone since morning. If I were as lucky as you, I'd never let her out of my sight. You know, for Mary, I might even stop drinking. That's enough, Ted. You've made the arrangements for Willie's men? Yes, sir. They'll be here on the 3.30 train. How do you know? We just had a telegram from Willie. Dad, we're not going to like the next few hours. As long as we live, we're not going to like them. Paul. Mary. Mr. Scott, this may upset you all terribly. But there isn't much time and somebody had to do it. You what? I just pledged my word to Jim Brennan and the rest. 
Is that you talk with? Where did you say I'd meet them? Out on the bridge, sir. Between the mill and the flats. That'll be halfway. For anyone who wants to conceal. And I said you'd come without the guards. Oh, sir, the men will behave right. Well, what did you say about the men from Duffield? That you'd send an order to Willie at the station to pay the brutes off and send them back where they belong. Well, I... I see I've had a busy morning. Dad, it's our chance. Do it, Dad, please. Where's Brennan now? He'll be coming this minute with the men to meet you on the bridge. And the train's due in half an hour. Dad. Yes, sir? I'm going to write a note. Take it to the station right away. And don't you or Willie leave there until the strike breakers have gone back to Duffield. Yes, sir. It's 3.30. Where's that special train from Duffield? Sorry, Mr. Kent. She's running a little late. A little late, huh? Well, just enough time to have a couple of quick ones. Yes, sir. The saloon right across the street. Good, good. Just a couple. A couple won't hurt. Gotta get that note to Willie. Yes, sir. Middle of the bridge, she said. This is it, Paul. Here they come, Dad. Jim's bringing them just like Mary said he would. Paul, the guard. You spoke to them? They'll not come near this bridge unless trouble starts, and there'll be no trouble. Let's get this over with. We stop here, men. Stop here. Well, Mr. Scott. Men, this is the first good moment I've known since this bad business began. My son here has told me, as he's told you, that concessions are in order. I assure you, I stand on that side. <laughs> All right, Brennan, what are your demands? First, five cents an hour increase for every man in the mill. Prices have been shooting sky high since the panic, Mr. Scott. All right, the increase is granted. Second, iron guards on all machines to protect against accidents. Granted. Third, recognition of our union and the promise of a closed shop. Well, I've always tried to be a fair employer... But if you think you want a union, I'll not stand in your way. Yes, I'll recognize the union, but as long as I live, I'll never refuse a job to any man willing to do an honest day's work. There you have it now, you fools! You want to go through this suffering and starvation over and over again? Get this madman out of here! Madman, you get fat! Will you stop it? I'll never let him come and fly his own hungry throat! You're more helpless than I am with the squeals here. You've been listening to this kind of lies and treachery for a hundred years. Lies? Treachery? Has any man here ever known me to lie to him? No, sir. Don't you understand? We, too, want to go back to work. We're in this thing together, and that's the way we want it. I say you're a liar and a hypocrite. Look, all of you, down the street, strikers! Wait! There's been a mistake. For once in his life, Pat Robert is right. Go back, Willie, go back. You've got to believe me, man. You've got to believe me. I sent my son Ted down to the state. You never lied to us, eh? And by the Holy Spirit, you never lied to us. He's going on, look out! Three men died on the bridge that afternoon. Jim Brennan. And my father, Patrick Rafferty. And Paul's father, William Scott. And I sat keeping awake in our house in the flat. I prayed that Paul, Scott, and I might never meet again. But I knew the footsteps were his. And as he came into the house, I prayed that I'd be strong enough to tell him what had to be. I've come to take you home, Mary. Mother's waiting for you. She wants you too, Mary. She loves you. We can never be married. The blood on the bridge will never wash off. That's not true. I sent your father into the hands of his murderers. I didn't honor my father. I went against my own. Haven't we suffered enough, Mary? My father reached into high heaven to put a curse on this man. That's from the dark ages. You can't believe that. I believe so many things that you could never believe. I know that if I bring any Scots into this world, 
They'll get you. Dead. Mary, stop it. I'm not going to let you throw our lives away. We have nothing left but each other. We... We have nothing left at all. Nothing at all. As, as I heard those words, I knew that the door had been closed between us. It seemed that all the world had died and only I lived on. Only the past was real. The future, empty and dark. I never saw Paul Scott again. But often his mother came to visit us. My sister Kate and me. In the little dressmaking shop she'd helped us set up. It was Mrs. Scott who told me of Paul's marriage to Louise Kane. And later on, of the birth of their son. And as the child grew up, of Paul's delight in taking the boy to the mill and teaching him the way of the poor and the puddles. Paul, I told you a dozen times I won't have my son hanging around that mill. But Louise, he had the time of his life. You should have seen it. I should have hated it. For nothing but a mill hand yourself. But I'd rather die than see my son like... Like me? Now look, Louise, it's not just because I had a boy at the mill. What's the matter? I had a scene with your mother. She's been very ill. She had no right to go out of the house so soon. You're quite right. I wonder where she went. You don't know? No. You don't know where she's been going all these years? No, I don't. You must ask her sometime. Dinner ready? No, not yet. Why not? I don't know why not. Should have married that Mary Rafferty. She would have been such a good house. Louise. This used to be a good home. A happy place. I want us to be that way again for my son. I'm willing to do my part. Then keep him away from that mill. Yes, sir. What did he so soon, Mrs. Scott? I hardly ever see you. I stayed too long, dear. It upsets Louise so. Mary, yes? Mary, this is my last visit with you. Oh, no. What kind of talk is that? Well, Dr. McClendon said... I don't you? mind. I'm ready to move on. Mary, there's something I want you to do. My share of the mills is one fifth. I'll be gone soon. And I'm leaving it to you. God. I don't need it. I really I No. But it may need you. Need me. The moment I'm dead, Willie will try to sell. Connie's always in debt. He'll be glad of the cash. And Ted uh, Ted doesn't care, poor soul. We've all forgiven Ted a hundred times. But he can't find a way to forgive himself. So you see, Paul may lose the mail. I see. Oh, it's heartbreaking, Mary, the way things have turned out for Paul. And for you too, dear child. Yes. You've got to help him keep the mail for his son. Mary, you haven't answered me. As long as I live. If ever I have to make up my mind about anything... Later, McCready, the coachman, came rushing into the shop. Mrs. Scott had suffered a stroke, and she was calling. Matter of fact, Mary, I'd like to have you stay here. Thank you, Louise. And I'm sure Paul will be pleased. Mary? I must confess, I'm not gifted around sick people. And until Connie gets here, if you can help us out, I, for one, shall be greatly relieved. Well, Mary, I'm here, Mrs. Scott. Don't leave. Don't leave me, Mary. No, Mrs. Scott. I won't leave you. I promise I won't leave you. Mary, wait a moment. Wait. Why do you avoid me, Mary? In all these weeks, I haven't had a second alone with you. The mother... i better go in. Oh, she's sleeping now. The nurse is with her. Won't you even let me tell you how deeply grateful I am? I love you, Mother, Paul. My mother loves you, Mary. Mary, if you only knew what... Paul! Sorry to disturb you, Paul. Yes, Louise, what is it? Your mother is dead. I'm sorry, all right. 
We've just come from Mother's funeral. I won't talk about it, Wood. I'm sorry, Paul, but this offer to sell has to be voted upon before Connie goes back to Europe. Does it? Connie, how would you like two million dollars in cash? Two million dollars? Jobs, darling, did you hear that? Connie, wait a minute. No, you wait a minute. We're all stockholders, and I have Ted's proxy authorizing me to vote for him. So, you're going to sell me out? For two million dollars, what would you say to that, Louise? What would I say? I'd be so happy to be rid of the mill, to be rid of this house. To get a thousand miles away from here that I... Louise! I shouldn't say no. Why shouldn't they know I've had to live in this house with that woman? My mother. No, not your mother, Connie. Mary. Mary. Uh, Louise means me. I... I just come to say goodbye. Of course I mean you. Look at her. Every nook and corner of the house weeps with this Irish pity. Paul's never loved anyone but her. Louise, stop it. <laughs> you... Yes, Willie, I should like to sell and what about you, Mary? What are you going to do with your share? What are you talking about? Your mother left her share of the men to me. Oh. How dare she? Because she chose to leave it to Mary. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Oh, wonderful, I bet. That's what you wanted, isn't it, Mary Rafferty? Two million dollars. And all the while, I thought you were in love with Paul. You haven't been a fool, Louise. I've loved Paul from the moment I walked into this house. I loved Paul's family, all of them. And I love the mill because it's part of the family. And as long as there's a breath in me, I'll fight to preserve it. Well, I'm sure I don't know what more you could want than two million dollars. You really don't, do you, Willie? However, we don't need your vote. It's you and Paul against Connie, Ted, and me. That's three to two. Oh, Connie. I, I've got to tell Mary. I'm over my head in debt. Yes. Yes, I understand, Connie. Only, Connie, do you remember that time that you and Giles took me to Paris? That little restaurant under the trees? And the two foreigners who filled their glasses with wine and then each of them spilled a little on the ground? Yes, yes. I remember. And Giles, do you remember we wondered why? And the waiter told us that it was the custom in their country to return to the earth a little of what they took from it. Oh, Connie, all your life you've taken. Here's your chance to give something back. Mary, I've, I've heard all this before. I know, darling. And that's all the stuff that, that dreams are made of and, and traditions and ideas. But here's something else. Listen, darling. I don't want the money. You can have the income from my share. I absolutely forbid it. But, Giles, I don't need the money. I have a lovely little business of my own. And really, oh, I... Stop it, Mary. Stop it. Connie. I won't stop, Willie. I won't. I won't. But, Connie, think what you're giving up. Think what you're... It's no use, Willie. Once Connie makes up her mind, she may not have much of a one, but it's quite immovable, believe me. If I may interrupt, Mary, McCready is waiting in the hall for your luggage. Thank you, Louise. Well, well, goodbye, all of you. I'll take you home, Mary. No, no, please. Well, drop me at the mill, and I've got to get out of this house. Paul, if you ever leave this house with her, you need never come back. I'll come back, Louise. But you won't be here. You're going to get exactly what you wanted, the chance to get out of this house, to get out of this town, to get away from the mill, from me, a thousand miles away. Nothing will suit me better. I'll take my son to Europe. Raise him as a gentleman. The boy stays here with me. He'll serve his apprenticeship with the Callahans and the O'Briens and take his place in the Scott Mills. You can have all the money you want, Louise, but that's all you can have. Mary. Mary, where, where did she go? She's just getting the carriage, Paul. If you hurry, you'll catch her. Thanks, honey. That too, Miss Mary, the dressmaking shop. If you please, McCready. Just a moment, Mac. Go back to the house. I'll take the reins. You, sir? Oh. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, Paul. Paul, please. It's just no use. No mm. use. No use, is it? Tell me. Do you mind the story of the Irishman named Bruce? Oh. Him hiding in the cave, despairing, but he never stopped trying at all, at all. And finally, he made it. Didn't he, Mary? Oh, darling... Yes. Yes, Paul, darling. Finally, he made it. Congratulations, Claire Dawson and Gregory Peck, for a superb performance. It's easy to understand why the Valley of Decision was voted America's favorite motion picture for 1945. Thank you, Mr. Keeley, and I'd like to express my appreciation to the theater goers of America. I'm sincerely grateful to them. Greer, you've earned the title, the first lady of the screen. 
was a pleasure to appear with you again. And Gregory, you've earned the title of one of the most sought-after stars in Hollywood. And Lux Toilet Soap, the title of the soap most sought after by the stars. That's right, Mr. Keeley. There's a gentleman with us tonight who is also to receive a gold medal award. Someone for whom I have a very warm personal feeling because he brought me to America. Someone who has been a friend and an inspiration to all of us at Metro Golden Mayor, Mr. Louis B. Mayer. You're quite right there. There is no one who has done more for the motion picture industry, and we're exceptionally happy to have him with us tonight. As head of the Metro Golden Mayor organization, his keen sense of showmanship and vision gave American theater goers seven out of ten pictures voted tops in Dr. Gallup's audience research poll for Photo Plays magazine for 1945. We of the Lux Radio Theater are proud to welcome Mr. Louis B. Mayer. Thank you, Greer and Bill Keeley. You've been very kind, and I'd like to pay tribute to all my co-workers at the studio who made it possible to produce so many of the most popular pictures of 1945. Without the executives, producers, directors, actors, writers, musicians, and technicians, all working as one family, it would not have been possible. I thought your radio adaptation of Valley of Decision was magnificent. And naturally, we at Metro Golden Mayor are proud of tonight's stars, Greer Garson and Gregory Peck. For Greer, it's the second consecutive year that she's won the Gallup Audience Research Poll. And I know you'll enjoy her more than ever. Co-starred with Clark Gable in a forthcoming picture, Adventure. Gable's back and Garson's got him. Well... They should make a sensational team. Mr. Mayor, would you tell our audience who the other recipients of Photoplay's Gold Medal Awards are? Yes. In addition to Greer Garson, who was voted America's favorite actress, awards are being presented to Mr. Edwin Knopf and Tay Garnett, producer and director of Valley of Decision. The favorite actor of the year, 1945, was Bing Crosby. You must be very pleased with the findings of Dr. Gallup's organization. Yes, it's very gratifying, because we of the motion picture industry must be guided by the individuals who attend the pictures of their choice. They, of course, are the audience that decides what type and quality of pictures and what stars will be America's favorites. And I think their choice, as reflected in Porter Play's annual poll, indicates that the American people as a whole are discriminating in their tastes and exacting in their standards. Mr. Mayor, we're happy that another Metro Golden Mayor picture is scheduled for the Lux Radio Theater next week. Won't you tell our audience about it? Gladly. The play will be Johnny Eager and will star our own Robert Taylor. It will be his first appearance in this theater since returning from the Navy. Bob will play his original screen role and we'll have opposite him Susan Peters, who has won the admiration of everyone. Ben Heflin will also be making his first appearance on the Lux Theater since returning to MGM from the Army and will be featured in the role that won him the Academy Award. Well, Mr. Mayor, we'll be looking forward to presenting Johnny Yeager next Monday evening. Meanwhile, it's getting late, and as soon as our curtain falls, we'll be hurrying to dinner at the Beverly Hills Hotel, where photo players' gold medal awards will be presented. Thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Mayor, and many thanks for being with us this evening. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join us in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Taylor, Susan Peters, and Van Heflin in Johnny Eager. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Tune in again next Monday night to hear Johnny Eager with Robert Taylor, Susan Peters, and Van Heflin. The Spry Treat of the Week. Fish fillets, golden crispy fillets, fried to delicate perfection in pure, bland, all vegetable spry. Serve them to your family. Watch folks smack their lips. For full, delicious flavor, rely on Spry. Remember, it's Spry. S-C-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Johnny Eager with Robert Taylor, Susan Peters, and Van Heflin. And why not tune in a half hour early to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.